as we begin our meeting, before we do our welcome from our president here. So I just wanted to add two of the memorable quotes from John Lewis, who passed away yesterday. Uh, first one is, if you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have a moral obligation to do something about it. And his other famous one is, get in good trouble, necessary trouble. Yes. So with that, I'm going to give it over to our outgoing PV Democrats President, Rasha Hall. She has been president of PV Dems for two years now, and she'll be taking the place of President em Emeritus Lynn Balmer. We've all enjoyed her leadership, and here she gives the welcome for our virtual, our first virtual picnic. Here is Rasha. Well, let's hope it's uh, the only virtual one, and we get to have a real picnic next year. But if not, this is going to work, and I'm wearing my picnic hat. Welcome, everybody, to uh, the Palos Verdes Democrats' annual picnic this year, hopefully only this year, uh, happening virtually. We have a wonderful, Anne, has, Anne, as our second vice president, has had wonderful meetings all year. And this year, she has a wonderful list of speakers for us at the picnic. And so um, I am going to turn it over to her. I want to say about John Lewis, I remember so well the, the march to when he went across the bridge and was beaten. I mean, John Lewis, 10 days older than I, only 15 days because that was a leap year. Um, otherwise, it would have been two weeks, 14 days. Anyway, I, so I, I've gone all along with him, remember all of those things, and um, we've lost a giant. But we've also lost another, another civil rights activist, C.T. Vivian, and, and his name has gotten lost because of the, the magnitude of, of John's name. But... Um, but we have lost a giant when losing uh, John Lewis. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to start it off our with our first speaker and call on the, chair the chairman of the Los Angeles uh, County Democratic Party, Mark Gonzalez. Okay, so Mark, I, have a, I have a few uh, intro, uh, Rasha, so let me... Okay. That. So our first, our first uh, visiting speaker here is LA County Democrat Party Chair Mark Gonzalez. He's been chair of the LACDP since 2017, the largest Democratic Party in the country. Mark Gonzalez, who also serves as district director to assembly member Miguel San Diego of District 53, is committed to leading the charge on political victories. So here is Mark. Thank you, Anne. Hello, Democrats. I'm lucky to be uh, your first speaker for today. And obviously, I echo the thoughts about uh, everybody's feeling. And, and, and I think I was shocked. I think we knew, but I was also shocked about the passing of, of John Lewis. But obviously, we've got much more work we need to do and live in his legacy uh, on Election Day. And so let's not, let's not forget what he fought for. And so we have to continue his legacy uh, by voting. So I hope you all are healthy and safe. I wish I was there with you. And in person today, but just want to thank you to the leadership and to uh, uh, Rasha for, for all of your work and, and everything you've done. I always tell this joke about how I first joined a Democratic club and then the next day I was elected president. So I understand how, uh, how much work and volunteer time it takes to be a member of a Democratic club, but especially be leadership. So kudos to all of you who are in leadership. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, Elizabeth Hennis, who's on this call. I think she's trying to put it here on gallery view. There we go. Elizabeth is, is on here on her phone. She's on our uh, staff, special projects coordinator. So if you're on there, give a little shout out to her. She will, she will definitely take care of any of your questions uh, regarding LACDP. Uh, we just finished a successful 2016, 2020, 2020 term uh, where we expanded our voter registration drive at naturalization ceremonies and all across the county. And I, and I want to keep stressing this, that since 2016, we went from 2.6 million Democrats to 2.9 million Democrats. And that's huge for us in LA County. Um, over 90% of our endorsed candidates over the past four years have won their election or made it to runoffs. 
And that's due in part to all of you, Harold and others um, on this call who, who have helped us tremendously at the local level. Uh, just a week ago, LACDP welcomed over 164 newly elected members uh, from their March primary, their alternates, uh, and LA County state and local elected leaders at our organizational meeting, where they were sworn in virtually. And uh, it was a very successful meeting due in part to Drexel Hurd and our staff. It was a lot of work in terms of putting it together, but we got it. We, we, we uh, did okay. We're going to be doing that again uh, for our regional vice chair elections on August the 1st. And our next general membership meeting of the term will be Tuesday, August 14th. And all of our meetings are open to the public and they can be found at lacdp.org forward slash meetings. Uh, we are less than one week out from our 2020 virtual JFK awards happening uh, this Saturday, the 25th. If you're following any of our, our social media on that, our honorees include uh, US Senator Kamala Harris, comedian Kathy Griffin, uh, union, uh, legendary Dolores Huerta and SEIU 2015 president, April Barrett. Uh, we have a ton of special appearances, including Senator Feinstein, Congressmember Schiff, Congressmember Waters, Congressmember Liu, uh, Secretary of State Padilla, Olympic medalist Michelle Kwan, actress Patricia Arquette, This Is Us store Mandy Moore, Will and Grace Eric McCormick, Eleni Kunalakis, Steve Bradford, uh, Supervisor Ridley Thomas, Council President Ari Martinez, and so many people that we're gonna try to fit in uh, next Saturday. So if you haven't bought your tickets, please do uh, get ready for it. It should be an exciting event. Uh, thank you to those of you in this picnic who've already sponsored and purchased your tickets. And for those of you who are interested in joining us, it's lacdp.org slash JFK 2020. Uh, we recently launched what we're calling an LACDP Presents, a virtual conversation series featuring our endorsed candidates and local leaders. We had our first virtual conversation a few weeks ago called Leading While Black how Democrats can meet and lead past the moment. And you can find that recording online. It was a panel discussion moderated by Black Los Angeles Young Democrats, Charity Chandler Cole, featuring Black leaders from across LA County. And we are launching our Candidates on Candidate series at the end of the month, videos that will feature two of our endorsed candidates having a discussion about their platforms and the current political climate. So stay tuned for that. And all of that can be found on our website as well. Um, we're 106 days from election day, folks, if I did my math right, 106 days for change. So here in California, we know that vote by mail ballots are going out to every voter. Uh, this will be crucial in our GOTV efforts in the fall. So we need to make sure that every voter knows how to return their ballot, uh, especially some of the myths that are going around about vote by mail. And the Republicans are just pissed about that, as you know. Uh, some of our GOTV highlights starting this fall, LACDP will work in again with the coordinated campaign to focus heavily on down ballot races. Um, LACDP is already laying the groundwork to work closely with the Biden campaign here in LA County, uh, getting ready for the general. And as some of you know, I'm, I'm a, an at-large delegate for the Biden campaign, so looking forward to working with them um, on that as we put together hopefully some LA activities uh, working with the DNC. Um, we're working closely with our five headquarter operations uh, with volunteer efforts, including Pasadena UDH, Westside Dem HQ, Grassroots Dems, Inland Communities Dem headquarters, and of course, DIPSIV. And we'll be providing weekly talking points and toolkits to our chartered headquarters, clubs, and organizations. So you all will be working with us uh, so that we can all stick to the same message um, as we lead into these next 106 days. Uh, this is all a brief snapshot of what we've been working on, and we'll be posting updates and launching new initiatives on our website at lacdp.org, as well as our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So make sure you check out those platforms. It's all new, so it's really exciting. And um, truly, guys, our Democratic clubs and organizations are the foundation of LA County's grassroots democratic work. So thank you all for, for your continuous leadership and keeping the blue wave strong and supporting LA Democrats and supporting our sister, uh, Christy Smith, who I know is on this call, and our other sister, uh, Congress member Nanette Berrigan, who I know is also on this call. And I believe I just saw my vice chair, Sergio Carrillo, just joined the call as well. So thank you all. Looking forward to working together as we win in November. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yes, Sergio Carrillo just did join and, and he is your vice chair. So uh, welcome, Sergio. Um, is there any, uh, before we continue on, we do have Christy Smith as our next, but is there any questions now for Mark Gonzalez? All, all compliments go to me, all complaints go to Elizabeth and Sergio. So that's okay, just, <laughs> And also just to let people know, uh, Reggie just put out, but we do have a link on our website to the JFK Awards event. Oh, great. 
Thank you. And uh, we were going to also announce it at the end as well, but thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So let's uh, move on to our next speaker. And this will be Assembly Member Christy Smith. She's Assembly District 38. He's running for Katie Hills Congressional District 25 after she resigned last November. She won the primary. That is, uh, Chrissy Smith won the primary, but a smaller percentage of Democrats tend to vote in a non-presidential election. She lost the special election to finish Hill's term in May. So she needs our support to win it back in November. So here is Christy Smith. Oh, thank you so much. Um, great introduction. And yes, we are completely undeterred by the results of the, the May special. Um, it was a very unfortunate timing with a lot of really unfortunate events and of course all across our country with the ramp up of um, you know COVID infections and what the pandemic was doing to us economically and physically no longer being able to be in each other's presence and really kind of shaped and changed the ground game for how we run our democratic campaigns. We all know you're activists, you're here, you've been doing this a long time, you know that we are boots on the ground, knocking on doors kind of party and we've simply in this moment lost the opportunity to do that. But that doesn't mean we've lost our enthusiasm, especially for flipping seats like this one. So for those of you not familiar, California's 25th is a small piece of Ventura County, and then a large portion, uh, the very top portion of Los Angeles County in the north. It's the communities of Santa Clarita, the Antelope Valley, a portion of the San Fernando Valley, and Simi Valley. This is a district that Hillary Clinton won in 2016 as it really began its transition from what had been historically a Republican district to now solidly uh, a blue-purple district. I mean, we, we have a registration advantage in this district of about seven points favoring Democrats, but they don't vote consistently yet. And that's where you and your support and your activism can come in. We really need you, especially those of you who have the privilege of living in you know, districts where you already have wonderful representation in seats that are relatively unchallenged, we could use your help here. So um, my director, my political director, Andrea, is on, and she can drop into the chat room for you. Ways you can get engaged in the campaign was welcomed when I first joined by uh, some folks who already said they were volunteering with the party's day of action today. But we need you. We need your help in calling our voters, and especially those who didn't engage in the May special election, and making sure that they've got a vote plan for when that ballot arrives to them in LA and Ventura counties. Those are gonna go out in October. Another new thing for us, I mean, we know that a lot of our voters over the years, we've done that work to make them vote by mail voters, but this cycle, everyone, because of the you know forethought that our governor had to issue an executive order, and then we backed that up with legislative action in the state legislature to ensure that everyone's going to be able to vote safely from home. But for voters who aren't used to that, for voters who are planning on going to a polling location, that too has changed. So we really need to be calling our voters, educating them so that they know a ballot will arrive to their house. All they need to complete that ballot is a pen um, and understanding the steps and instructions and then literally dropping it in the mail as soon as they get it. We wanna to start to shape and change the mindset of Democratic voters across the state to not just think of election day itself, but really think about this in terms of a process and having a much longer runway for them to participate as voters. That's where you come in. That's where you can be so helpful. And of course, we all know that everything that's at stake all across our country from just personal health and well-being and, and individual health security to security of our governing institutions that we all fundamentally believe in and want to hold safe and hold harmless are, are at stake in this election. Um, healthcare justice, economic justice, economic opportunity, how we rebuild and what we rebuild this state and this country into once this crisis is past us is the opportunity that's ahead of us. So although we face this great moment of crisis and challenge and, and all of us feel the pressure of that moment, it's incumbent on us as activists to reach out to our voters and present this as our opportunity and to empower them to know that their connection to that opportunity is their vote. And we really need to be able um, to lift them up and, and have them participate starting October 5th and then running all the way through November 3rd so that the future looks a whole lot brighter for all of us. So I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I thank you for all the help you've offered already and please stay with us uh, through the whole fight. Thank you so much. Uh, there, um, 
Any questions now for Christy Smith? I see where uh, Nancy put out that there is a day of action call, uh, CADM day of action callers are making calls for Christy right now. So, um, and I do know, uh, I, I think Lynn Bomber's on, but I know that her group has, as well has been doing calls. So thank you Hello. so much. Uh, did someone else talk? Hi, can you hear me? Who's that? This is Sandy Davidson from PVE. Uh huh. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. You have a question for Christy Smith? No, Sandy just joined. Oh, Thank, oh, oh, thanks, sorry. Sandy. She's just joining. Okay. I'm sorry, yeah. Christy. That's okay. Okay. All right. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're going to move on now. We have lots of speakers, and I hope you can continue with us, Christy. So uh, we're going to now move on to uh, Congressman Nanette Berrigan. She represents Congressional District 44, which used to be Janice Hahn's district. We've known Ms. Berrigan since she was elected to Hermosa Beach City Council in 2013. She's running for Congress and was recently shown in, I saw you in People Magazine, at a food drive in Watts with singer songwriter actress Janelle Monet. So I thought that was pretty cool. So anyway, here is uh, Ms. Berrigan. Well, hello, Democrats. Thank you all. Um, Madam President Rasha Hall, thank you for your leadership and uh, Second Vice President Ann. Thank you all for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to be able to join you in what is Ted Luce District right next door. Um, but as you mentioned, um, since my days on the city council in Hermosa Beach, have uh, really a lot of your members, not just helped me for that election, but working together to fight drilling along California's coastline. So thank you all so very much. I'm in Washington, D.C. I just got in last night getting ready for two weeks of votes here as we vote on appropriations bills. Um, I want to start also by thanking the club and all your members for all the work you've done on the civil rights issue but also memorializing my colleague and dear friend, John Lewis, who when I first came to Congress, um, would go up to him and say, Mr. Lewis, and he would always say, call me John, just a humble, uh, nice guy, always very supportive. And I had the pleasure of serving with him and walking across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Um, and so uh, we're gonna miss him and look forward to being able to remember him this week here with our colleagues. Um, I wanna shed a little light on what's happening this week. Uh, we have a lot of appropriations bills in Congress that we are voting on. Uh, I also want to highlight what has just recently happened. Uh, we have had um, the House Democrats pass a moving forward bill, HR2. It's an infrastructure package. And in that infrastructure package uh, were two of my bills. One of them is called the Climate Smart Sports Act. It's a bill that will help green the ports across the country. I happen to represent the Los Angeles port. Um, and we have LA Long Beach right next to each other. And they're great for causing jobs, movement of goods. We also have pollution that comes off of our ports. And so this is an incentive program that will help green the ports. I'm happy that made it into that legislation, along with a bill called the Outdoors for All Act. It's a bill that will invest more money into green spaces, uh, which we need in underserved areas um, and in urban areas. And so super, super happy about that. Uh, getting into um, legislation, but people need help. People are calling our office all the time about the need for more of a stimulus package to help them put more money in their pockets and the concern about what is going to happen when unemployment and the federal ben benefit expires. So House Democrats have been working hard. Uh, two months ago, uh, we uh, almost two months ago now, we passed the HEROES Act, which is a piece of legislation that will put money into the pockets of local governments. This is money that would go into firefighters, for teachers and local governments so they can make sure to help provide services to all of you. As we know, it all starts locally and they can't do those services and have been really hit hard by COVID. And so this bill, which we've been trying to put pressure on uh, the Senate and we understand that the Senate Leader McConnell may negotiate now, uh, now that as we're going into the August stretch, but let me tell you the importance, like I don't need to tell you the importance, uh, but we need to take back the Senate because it's, it's unconscionable that House Democrats are doing the work. We're putting bills um, across 
the House side and they're sitting in the Senate and there is no action, whether it is providing relief for COVID funding, which we know this president is trying to stop more money into going to testing and tracing when uh, this uh, virus rages on. It's totally unjust. And if you saw his interview today, uh, he doesn't believe in helping the American people on this. It's crazy. It's outrageous. And that is what's at stake in November. And that's why I want to thank you all, the foot soldiers, the grasswork roots organizers, all of the work that you're doing to make sure we take back this White House for all the work that you're doing to pick up this seat and that we need to get Christy Smith elected to the House and all of this work that we need to do to make sure that we take back the Senate so that we can make sure to move forward for the American people because it is for the American people. Now, just briefly, I have a race in November. Um, I have a Democratic opponent. As you know, we have the top two system. Uh, my opponent is running as a teacher disability advocate. And so we don't take anything for granted. Even though she hasn't really raised much money, she's been active putting out lawn signs. She's got a great ballot title. And I don't want to be the victim of somebody going into the voting booth and saying, well, let's pick the first Democrat on the ballot. Uh, let's pick somebody who's got a good ballot title. So I'm going to be doing work. Uh, we're doing some mail. We'll be making some phone calls, but also putting much focus on taking back the House, trying to get the Senate and get uh, more Democrats elected into our House because we need, and this is one of the best things that we have seen, women, people of color, women of color at all levels to make sure that we all have a voice. And let me just end by saying, I appreciate all the work you're doing. Let's keep up the work on the census. Let's call our friends, our families, and keep that going too. Because if we're undercounted, we could lose more than just a seat. They're predicting that we will lose a seat in Southern California, uh, in the House. We got to make sure we get everybody we can to go out and vote. A, so we have the resources uh, that we deserve to get, that we will not get if we don't have an accurate number. Uh, but so the census is critically important. So please keep that up. Please keep up all your work. I really appreciate all the work you, you do. And I miss you. The one upside of this virtual picnic is this year I don't have to yell across a big lawn and hope somebody hears like I had to last year or when people said, we can't hear you, speak up. So thank you all again for your work. And let's make sure to keep safe, keep healthy, wear a mask, do all the things that we need to make sure we're keeping our community safe and help uh, prevent the spread of this very terrible virus as it's taking so many lives and so many of our loved ones. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Bergen. Uh, so we do have a couple questions. One that came in before uh, the meeting and it's actually a similar one that came on the chat. So the one that came before was from Connie Sullivan so she believes you sit on the Homeland Security Committee. I have concerns about the recent news about the DHS police that are arresting protesters in Portland. I heard that more DHS police will be deployed in other Democratic run cities to achieve quote law and order. What can we do about this? And a similar question came over chat. Well, thank you, Connie. And thanks for that question. Um, just this morning, we, we put up a, a, something on social media about this. But well, here's what's happening. This administration is used to going rogue, and they're doing it again with the use of Homeland Security. We know that Homeland Security has done it, too, when they were separating women and children from each other. Look, the reality here is that we have to try as best we can to get in any language into appropriations bills, and maybe that's how you use it, to try to get some language in to uh, prevent money to being from being used in this way. Uh, but I'm working with uh, and will work with my committee on Homeland Security to make sure that we are having uh, the chairman, uh, Mr. Thompson, a call for hearings and do what we can. It's a little challenging because even when we get things, uh, we, we propose legislation, if it doesn't get to the Senate and the House and the president, then it really is, doesn't go anywhere. We don't have an attorney general that's doing much of anything and fighting um, or is interested really in doing anything to follow the law. And so we will see what we can do on whether there's any language we can get into an appropriations bill that will help uh, prevent uh, the use of dollars for this. Totally wrong. It, and when I saw the headline this morning about how DHS said they were unprepared uh, to do this, it's because they weren't prepared because it's wrong and because this is not their job. This is more of abuse of power by this president and administration. 
and uh, we'll continue to speak out and continue uh, to make sure we do what we can uh, in the Congress. Thank you. The, uh, one other question came from uh, Denzi Nelson. Are we still somewhere just around 50% of folks in LA County for answering the census, or is it worse than 50%? The last time I checked, we were over 50%. I, I, I don't know the exact number, but we were over, and uh, we just got to keep working on the numbers. One right. of the things that we're doing, uh, we're sending out a mailer to people, especially in English and Spanish, and uh, focusing on some of the undercounted areas. The reality is, uh, we just had the president, if you didn't notice, uh, put out uh, something that he's going to sign an executive order saying that undocumented people are not to be counted. And so I believe this is a tactic that he's doing to try to get people to say, well, I'm not going to bother filling it out because I'm not going to be counted or to cause more fear and concern um, into communities so they do not fill it out. Mm, exactly. And so that's a concern. Let me also talk about one little thing about the census that I just learned about that um, if you hear about, uh, make sure you reassure people. The census has a division that's called the victim surveys. And I have family members who got this call and didn't know they, it was completely voluntary. They're talking to children uh, under 18 and over 12 and asking them questions like, have you committed a crime? and asking them if they've been sexually uh, abused by their own parent, in which the parent is allowed to be present. Something seems very wrong with this, and my concern is if this gets out, more people are gonna be afraid and thinking this is part of the census. So the Census Bureau is doing this, it's a separate arm, but it's not required to fill out the census, and it's totally voluntary. So if you hear about that and somebody tells you about that's why they don't wanna do the census, let's make sure we reassure to them that it's not part of the census, and that is completely different and separate, even though it is a Census Bureau. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so we're gonna move on to our next speaker, who actually is flying today. Uh, so this is Congressman Harley Ruda of Cong Congressional District 48. So he had to uh, get back for the vote, like uh, Nanette and um, others have to be there Monday, Monday for the votes, but he's flying today, but he sent us a video. So. Uh, Congressman Harley Ruda, he, he uh, beat a 15-term, just to, so you know, he beat the 15-term incumbent Dan, Dana Ro Rohrenbacher back in November 2018 and needs our support in the, the November, in the November election to keep OC blue. So uh, he provided us a video, so I'm going to share my screen and uh, play you his video. And also he has... Uh, his uh, congressional rep, uh, Elisa Napero, and I'll introduce her afterwards. So. Sorry. Hello, Palos Verdes Democrats. Happy day of action. And we are about 100 days away from election day. November can't come soon enough. It's weird not to be with you at this year's picnic came to my first annual picnic when I first started out as a candidate in 2017, and this has become something of a tradition for my team. The PV Democrats were one of our first and biggest supporters, and your volunteering helped flip this seat in 18 and will help us keep it in 2020. And I know we all took a lot of satisfaction in defeating Dana Rohrabacher. In many ways, we have a tougher race ahead of us this year than we did in 2018. My opponent is an advisor to President Trump, is charged with leading Orange County's COVID-19 response. And I'm sure you are all seeing how terrible the county leadership has been in handling this crisis here in Orange County. And she's raising millions of dollars from the NRCC machine. In fact, she's the top fundraiser of all frontline races in the country. So we know we have an incredibly difficult race again. It's going to be tough, but with your support, I know we'll get it done, just like we did in 2018. Thank you for your support. Thank you for letting me be your guest all these years. I hope you all stay safe, stay healthy, and hopefully we'll be together again, not too soon from now, but by 2021. Thanks so much. Take care. Okay. And so joining us today to take questions, uh, or Congressman Ruda is Elisa Napuri. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, she's uh, Congressman Ruda's campaign manager for the 2020 re-election. She's a native of uh, 
of District 48. She moved home to South Orange County to work with the California Democratic Party as an organizer for three targeted congressional districts in Orange, in Orange County, the 39th, the 45th, and now the 48th uh, in the summer of 2017. So here's Elisa. Thanks, Anne, and thank you, uh, Rasha, for your time and, and congratulations and serving a great term. Um, thank you for letting us and understanding that Orange County has like one flight from Orange County to DC now, so he would much rather be hanging out with all of you, but I think he's crammed somewhere in American Airlines. Um, but you know, I'm seeing some familiar faces that helped get Harley elected. And um, I see some people whose sneakers probably got switched out after they they helped knock doors and get Harley through the, the primary by 125 votes um, and get us through the general election and a real nail biter as well. We went into election night just completely tied with Dana Rohrbacher and the race to watch. And I think we were one of the first ones in Orange County to be called um, because of our overwhelming volunteers. And so now we're up against um, a different opponent, as Harley said, she's a bit more difficult. Her husband's the former chair of the California GOP. She advises Trump um, and she's in charge of the Orange County Board of Supervisors. So she has a lot of name ID. So we're gonna need all of our volunteers out there, um, actually in home, uh, calling people. And I have been telling everyone in LA County who feel a bit split between all the different Orange County districts that maybe they spend an hour on the phone calling for Harley, an hour for Katie, an hour for Christy Smith to make sure we flip that seat back. Um, this is gonna be a really tough race and we need to make sure like uh, Rep. Barragon said, we need to make sure we get the house, keep the house, expand our lead there, flip the Senate, and then flip the White House so we can get some stuff done. So I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. Um, I'm, I'm a professional Harley impersonator some days, so I'm here to help you out. Okay, so um, I see a question Hi. from Kay. Yeah, yeah, did you see the question? Sorry. Yeah, I knew that what is the nature of the campaign primarily phone work um i have a joke with our organizers that like we're going to try literally everything so we're going to try every single possible thing we could do safely to make sure that people know to vote um, every single time we call someone we're also going to remind them that there's a census happening so um that's also super important in our district and uh, it's primarily going to be phone banking and text banking for volunteers unless you live in Orange County. Um, we're going to roll out a program where we actually have one designated person in a neighborhood that gets sticky notes and puts it on people's doors to invite them to virtual events such like such as this, where they can actually be face to face with Harley without putting anyone in danger. And maybe we can try to break through the silos of, of social media and get people to, to meet him in a more intimate setting than just watching him on TV or in a town hall. Okay, um, any more questions or we're gonna move on? Thank you so much. Thanks, Anne. Okay, um, uh, let me just check one thing here. Oh, I see there, I'm sorry, There. can you explain in detail? We'll have her do that uh, on chat, okay? This, that, there was a question about your postcard program. Okay, so maybe you can reply about that on chat. So um, our next speaker was Los Angeles County Supervisor Janice Hahn. She's one of uh, five Board of Supervisors. She represents the 4th District, and she champions Care First, Jail Last Investment, strengthening non-law enforcement crisis response. And back in May, she urged Governor Newsom to reopen retail businesses safely during the pandemic. I think you might change your opinion now, but um, here is Ms. Janice Hahn. Well, hello, uh, PV Democrats. It's great to see you, and I kind of uh, am enjoying this as well. Of course, I miss seeing everybody uh, in person, but I will tell you, I was on another call of Zoom just moments before this one uh, with some of my elected officials in my district. So it's great to just stay home and um, you know only dress from the waist up to talk to everybody. So it's really great to be here. Thanks for continuing to have this. I know um, many people have uh, evoked the memory of the great John Lewis, and I'll just add my uh, two cents to that as well. What an honor for me to have served uh, in Congress with John Lewis. And uh, two great memories I have of him. One, 
I joined him on his uh, civil rights pilgrimage where he takes members of Congress to Selma, uh, Montgomery and Birmingham and teaches us, inspires us, enlightens us about the real history of this country. Uh, and that of course was the 50th anniversary of uh, Bloody Sunday where John was, was beaten up and President Obama came on that trip with us and I think gave one of his uh, greatest speeches that he ever gave. Um, and that's a bipartisan trip. So you have members of Congress from both sides of the aisle uh, being taught history by John Lewis. And the other memory I have of him was uh, in 2016 when we decided on the spur of the moment, the Democrats did, to take over the House floor and have a sit-in protest. And so we had an all-night sit-in on the House floor, uh, sitting there alongside John Lewis. The Speaker of the House at the time, Paul Ryan, was so incensed by our theatrics that he, ha he ordered the house cameras to be turned off uh, so that C-SPAN uh, could not broadcast our protest. And at that time, I didn't know how that technology worked. I still don't, but there was the Facebook Live and some of the members understood Periscope at the time. So they began live streaming what we were doing on the House floor. So we were singing, we were getting up and making spontaneous speeches. Um, and so the world could still watch what we did. We were, it's hard to believe now, but we were protesting and demanding that the House Republicans schedule a vote on common sense gun legislation. That's uh, all we were doing. I think there was just two aspects of that at the time. There was a uh, um, uh, universal background check and maybe closing the uh, gun show loophole. And they refused to ever hold that vote. So at the end, we all marched out with John Lewis down the Capitol steps. We were greeted by a huge throng of people who had, uh, unbeknownst to us, gathered from Washington, D.C. and beyond to give us encouragement and um, cheer us on as we continued this all-night sit-in. We never did get the vote. The Republicans refused to ever host that vote. But I like to say that uh, one of the best things I did in Congress was to take a stand by sitting down uh, with John Lewis. So I, he was a great American. Our country is better off for his unwavering dedication and passion. Um, he was the original Black Lives Matter. And uh, for him, it wasn't just a slogan. It was a lifelong um, commitment to ensuring the respect and dignity uh, for African Americans in this country. You know, uh, in the county, we're trying to meet this moment uh, by really continuing to look at our criminal justice reform in the county. And we're looking at uh, tearing down the men's central jail. We're looking at realigning money uh, away from law enforcement and instead investing it in alternatives to incarceration. Um, we're going to um, look at a sweeping motion that Mark Ridley Thomas is bringing in on Tuesday on uh, how we might look inside ourselves in the county of Los Angeles in our practices, um, in our policies, and whether or not racism has crept into um, the county of Los Angeles over the years, um, thus uh, oppressing in some way or holding back the ability of African Americans in LA County to achieve their um, fullest um, you know, um, determination in life. So we'll be taking that up on Tuesday. You know, um, in terms of uh, COVID-19, of course, LA County has uh, the highest number of cases where uh, over 124,000 people have been infected. Uh, we have uh, over 4,000 deaths uh, here in LA, or close to 4,000 deaths in LA County. And um, we're just not getting any better. It's going in the wrong direction. 
And you're right. I think we were so um, troubled by walking that fine line, threading that needle between public health and the economy. We had so many people unemployed. We had so many uh, businesses that were going under. We were worried that we would be contributing to our already um, you know, out of control homeless population that we uh, were trying to get people back to work. We were trying to open businesses up, but we really were, were operating under the um, possibly misguided uh, suggestion that people would follow the rules. We, we expected people to wear masks. We expect people to physically distance. We expect people to stay home as much as possible. But as we saw, uh, so many people just refused to wear their masks. So many restaurants were not um, implementing safety protocols um, that I think we saw the, um, the, the spike in cases uh, uh, reflect that. So uh, the governor is rolling back some of the openings, uh, particularly for counties like ours, LA County's on the watch list. And so he's also said schools, school districts that are in the county of LA um, cannot uh, open in-person learning, uh, but must do uh, um, social uh, learning from a distance uh, this fall. So one of the things I'm doing to address that, I'm uh, introducing uh, an idea on Tuesday that we look for um, county parks and libraries in the unincorporated county areas as possible alternative sites for uh, some kids whose parents have to go back to work or who maybe aren't set up with uh, Wi-Fi or you know any other uh, resources and tools to actually learn uh, from a distance. So we're gonna try to help out school districts. Now in uh, where all of you are, uh, there's no unincorporated county that has the parks or the libraries, but you might bring that up to your uh, city councils and your school districts that they also might look at um, opportunities in their own parks and libraries to kind of help out uh, parents and kids as we enter a, a school uh, season where kids aren't going to show up to um, learn in classrooms. The last thing I'll say, and then, I, then I, I'll take some questions. Um, you know, I was already concerned about uh, COVID-19 affecting people's ability to vote in person. I didn't want people to have to choose between, um, you know, voting or their health. So I, uh, along with my colleagues on the Board of Supervisors, instructed Dean Logan to mail out a ballot to every single registered voter in LA County, whether or not you applied for it, requested it, wanted it. Um, we'll still have in-person vote centers around LA County, uh, but I wanted to get a, a jump on things by requiring our registrar recorder to send a ballot to everyone. So that's something I think we could all work together on is doing um, a, a good job of educating people you know, we're a little bit behind the eight ball in terms of other states who have uh, embraced voting by mail. And, um, you know, there's still a lot of people that think you have to request it or you have to have an excuse, you have to have a doctor's note, you have to prove that you're, uh, you're not gonna be here. And we need to remind people that everybody um, can and probably should if they can uh, vote uh, by mail at home sitting at their kitchen table. And so I could use your help in educating people to do that, but I think it's a good move. Uh, this pandemic is not going anywhere. Uh, we're no closer to getting a vaccine or a drug to treat you if you get it. Um, and I think people are scared. We might be in another uh, complete lockdown uh, in the fall. So I, I'm glad that we took that progressive step in the county at least of making sure every uh, voter will indeed get their own mail-in ballot. So again, thank you to all you great Democrats for all you do. I don't know if you saw, I um, commemorated uh, last Thursday the 60th anniversary of 
of uh, President Kennedy accepting uh, the Democratic nomination at the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. Uh, I lit the torch on Thursday, last Thursday to remind people of what a great moment that was for Democrats, what a great moment that was for uh, Los Angeles, the Coliseum. And uh, if you had a chance, go back and read his, uh, if you'll recall, it was called the New Frontier Speech. And the words that he gave 60 years ago are so relevant today about one of his great lines was, we need leadership, not salesmanship. And I thought how appropriate uh, for the person that we're trying to get out of the White House um, now. Anyway, great to be with you all. Thanks. Thanks. For the, thank you for the reminder. That is, that's very good. We'll, we'll look, I'll look it up and put a link uh, when we talk about this. So we have a couple of questions, but we also have to move on. Uh, but the question had to do, uh, some are having to do with, you know, some people are enforcing masks and some people aren't, you know, like Manhattan Beach just came out with an enforcement. And are you seeing uh, that we're going to have to do that? And then the second one uh, has to do with, you know, when people go for their, uh, uh, for their test, uh, and, and if they don't, can't pay for it, are they being told, uh, how they can pay for it. So let's answer those two questions and then we'll perhaps move on. Right. I do uh, feel like more and more uh, local, local jurisdictions are doing their own enforcing on mass. Uh, the county is, um, has certainly um, mandated that. Uh, City of Los Angeles, Eric, Eric Garcetti has mandated mask wearing. We're uh, cracking down on restaurants and other facilities who are not complying with these safety protocols. Um, so we're going to get, we're going to start uh, citing uh, places that aren't complying, fining uh, restaurants that aren't complying with safety protocols. But I think we're going to have to get to that point where we begin to enforce mandatory wearing of masks. We know that wearing masks keeping yourself uh, physically distanced and avoiding crowds um, is still the best way to slow this virus. At this point, we have uh, about 160 ICU beds left in the County of Los Angeles. We have over 2000 people right now in the hospital. And our big worry, of course, is that we don't overwhelm our doctors and our nurses and our hospitals, and we are dangerously close to being there again. So it's out of control. Everyone needs to do their part uh, to try to slow this spread. Um, we have a lot of sites in LA County where you are not charged for your tests. Um, and people can do that by going on the county's website. Um, and uh, you should not have to pay uh, for uh, a test. Now, some of these private clinics and urgent care places um, I got tested yesterday at one, but I, because I have insurance, it didn't cost me anything, but I heard them telling people um, that if they didn't have insurance, it was $170. So people should check before they go. Um, and again, we have a lot of county sites uh, that are free and we have a lot of those drive through Dodger Stadium is one, they're all over the county. Uh, but uh, if you have any problems finding a place, you can always contact, I know Erica Velasquez is on this Zoom call. She's uh, my um, uh, district person here in San Pedro, and she'll be happy to help anyone figure out where they can get a test. She got tested yesterday too. So okay. we're all getting tested. Okay, well, I'm glad. And, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank okay. you. All right, so we're going to move on to our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is uh, Rolling Hills Estate City Council person, Judy Mitchells. She's been the, on the city council since 1999. Um, I understand you might be, this might be your last year. But anyway, she serves on the regional council of the Southern California Association of Governments called SCAG and represents the S South Coast Air Quality Management District uh, on the California Air Board. And um, she's also a board member of the South Bay Cities Council of Governments. And that's how we got two of our speakers this past year was through uh, knowing uh, Judy. So here is Ms. Mitchell. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Russia and uh, Anna uh, for inviting me today. And uh, I, I will say I'm not running for office uh, in November. I've served uh, five terms, almost 20 years, and I think it's time for me to move on. Uh, but I certainly have enjoyed my uh, time on the city council and in all the uh, other organizations that were related to that. Um, as uh, Anne mentioned, uh, I am a member of the California Air Resources Board and a member of the South Coast Air Quality Management District Board, and I'm going to focus my remarks today on the work that's being done in those two agencies. Um, as we face this uh, uh, burden of the pandemic and uh, all the disease and deaths that we're seeing, it brings to mind that um, there is a relationship between uh, the pandemic and uh, pollution and air quality in the region where we live. Um, as you know, air pollution does cause respiratory illness, uh, pulmonary disease, and uh, the, the, those vulnerabilities that people have are certainly affected by uh, COVID-19. As you know, we also have still in California the worst air quality in the nation uh, and is particularly bad here in South Coast as well as the San Joaquin Valley. So uh, the Air Resources Board has been very busy in the past year uh, uh, working on reducing the pollution that we experience from from trucks. And uh, they have on their plate a trio of uh, regulations, which is designed to attack that kind of pollution from our trucks. On June 25th, the Air Resources Board passed what, we call, what is called the Advanced Clean Truck Rule. It is a bold move the first kind of regulation that anyone in the world has done. And it is going to be controversial, uh, but it requires uh, manufacturers of trucks to sell a certain percentage of zero emission trucks in California, uh, phased in over a period of years beginning in 2024 and ending in 2035 with the expectation that all trucks sold in California by um, 2045 will be zero emission. Um, in connection with that, uh, we have seen since the regulation was passed on June 25th, 15 states plus Washington, D.C. have announced plans to follow California's lead in enacting uh, zero emission truck rules. So we're not alone in this, and we're sending a signal to truck manufacturers that uh, please make them. Uh, uh, we will help you sell them. And along with the regulation that requires those sales, we're now looking at corresponding legislation that will uh, encompass a fleet rule that will, re will require certain fleets within the state to um, have certain percentages of zero emission trucks in their fleets. That regulation is just now in development uh, just beginning, and we expect uh, that regulation to come before the board in 2021. Also, dealing with trucks is what is called the omnibus rule that just came out in the last couple of weeks. This is a rule that we have been looking at for quite some time, but it is focused on um, lowering the NOx emissions from heavy duty trucks. Uh, as you may or may not know, uh, NOx emissions are deadly. They combine with sunshine to create ozone. And we have in Southern California uh, pretty challenging uh, requirements under the Federal Clean Air Act to reduce ozone by about 45% in the year 2023 and another 45% uh, uh, by 2031. Uh, so we are very desperately working on all fronts to reduce these uh, emissions so that we can meet the Federal Clean Air Act deadlines. Um, one other thing that was done recently and is sort of in play right now is the at birth rule where the Air Resources Board is requiring 
the bo boats that call at our ports to reduce the emissions as they are docking at our ports. That regulation came for hearing a couple of weeks ago, but it is not finalized. It will be finalized in August when it comes up for the final uh, hearing on that. Um, moving now to the South Coast Air District, um, several things are in play there. The South Coast is working on MOUs with the twin, twin ports and with the airports in the region, each of them to reduce their emissions from sources that emit come from the come from their uh, facilities. Uh, we're also working on what is called indirect source rules. Whereas we have the um, authority under the law to control uh, emissions from indirect sources. And so we're working on rules that will uh, reduce emissions from warehouses. And by through that mechanism, we may be able to regulate trucks that call at the warehouses requiring a certain percentage of the electric, um, requiring uh, charging infrastructure at, at warehouses. Uh, this would find as an incentive-based, whoops, someone is, is talking, an incentive-based um, kind of point points uh, scoring kind of regulation. So, um, and uh, the other thing that is sort of changed the way that the air districts and the CARB uh, look at air pollution is legislation uh, AB 617, which was authored by Christina Garcia and Eduardo Garcia, this requires the air boards, both the, all the uh, air districts boards, as well as CARB, to um, look at air pollution from the ground up. And what it is, what, what it amounts to is that each year, um, certain communities who are severely impacted with air pollution are chosen uh, to be focused on. And um, we have in Southern California, uh, five air districts, the, uh, five communities that we're, we're looking at. It's called the Community Air Protection Program. Uh, the, one of these is in West Long Beach in Wilmington. Another one is in Muscoy out in San Bernardino. A third one is in East LA, Boyle Heights and West Commerce. Those three were the first chosen in Southern California. These are all environmental justice communities that suffer severe impacts from pollution. And the idea is to focus on them, to develop emission reduction programs specific for the community, and to work with the community with steering committees and invitations to the community to come and help us work with them on reducing their emissions. It's a joint program between, the, between CARB, California Air Resources Board, and the local air district that is, uh, is, has that community within its jurisdiction. And there are several of these communities all across the state. There are uh, several in San Joaquin Valley. There are uh, Oakland and Richmond, our uh, air, uh, air protection programs in, in the Bay Area. So they're spread across uh, California. And uh, it's a very good program because we're now focusing where the worst air pollution is and where we can do the most to, um, to help correct that. So I will stop with that and be uh, uh, hope, answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Judy. You have way, way too much more information than, than we can uh, have for today, but we'll have to have you back. Um, one, but just uh, someone, I think Connie did ask, when, when are you leaving the uh, city council? When's your time up? And does that mean you're also off HUMD? Yes, it will mean that I will, I will leave all those positions. And of course, the election is November 3rd for the city. Okay. And normally the changeover for our city comes the first at the first council meeting in December. So that's when I would expect. Well, we're going we're gonna to miss you. <laughs> well, it's been a wonderful experience for me. And I uh, was so glad that I that I walked down that path. It wasn't one that I ever chose for myself when I started out uh, in, in my life or in my career, but it's been a wonderful journey and I have enjoyed every minute of it. It's been a great privilege to serve. 